Uh, great to have you guys this morning, those of you here this morning and those of you watching us online, great to have you. Uh, today uh, is really exciting uh, for multiple reasons, but uh, one uh, reason that I am so excited about is because we're starting our new series called Hashtag Blessed um, on Sermon on the Mount, okay? So uh, really excited about it. So next six weeks, we're going to spend some time on the Sermon on the Mount and what it means and what it means to us today. And, but personally, it is um, very important for me. Uh, when I came to know the Lord, uh, I did not come to know the Lord as not growing in a Christian church or anything like that at all. Uh, so when I came to know the Lord, I was 24. Uh, so uh, no exposure to Christianity. Um, but one thing that I loved about the word of Jesus was the Sermon on the Mount. And so I thought I knew that pretty well, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I read it multiple times. And, um, but it was not until when I got to Israel uh, in 2006 uh, that when I truly understood uh, what the Sermon on the Mount was all about. So before that then, uh, that means I had about, oh, about four, four years uh, being a Christian, being a Christian, and uh, it is not until when I actually uh, went to Israel, uh, stand on the place where the Sermon on the Mount actually have taken place, which I will show you the pictures today, super excited. Um, but there's an actual thing that actually happened and the place that we actually go to, and my mentor uh, actually shared that story with me, what does it mean uh, to even be blessed, the word blessed. Uh, so that actually changed the way I understand Christianity as a whole, uh, and the, uh, it impacted me greatly. So my hope for you today, uh, I don't know where you are as far as the spectrum of understanding what blessed is. I pray that my prayer to you is that as we study this word together, that you will also grasp the true meaning and really uh, impact your life in a great way, Okay. Uh, so let's go right into the scripture today. Uh, we're going to read from Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to start in chapter 4, and we're going to lead on to chapter 5. Okay, so we're going to read from chapter 4, verse 12, and all the way to the end. I'm going to skip some verses, but uh, you can just follow along on the screen behind me. And here's what the Word of God says. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison... He departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And healing all kind of sickness and all kind of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. And those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them. Great multitude followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea. And beyond Jordan. Chapter 5. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you. They say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. As we begin our series on the Sermon on the Mount, I want to begin by saying there's just no way this morning for me to cover everything. And this is the problem with me. When I get up here, I try to explain everything at one at a time. I always do. Even like yeah, last service, I ran out of time. Anyways, but my encouragement to you is that you, next six weeks, to be studying the Sermon on the Mount every day. And one way for you to actually do that is follow our starter blog. It's CLC Starter. We have our own uh, daily blog that actually goes over the scripture that we actually go through on Sundays. And we have a contributor that's going to be talking about the sermon and also the text that we're going to be reading today in details in their take. So you can actually join along every day. We can actually study this word together. Uh, they're going to mention a lot of different things that I will not be able to cover and hopefully um, that they will be able to do so. So please check out clcstarter.com. You can actually download an app or you can actually see it in our church application. What does it mean to be blessed? That's the question. Now, as I even pose that question to you this morning, you probably have some thoughts that's coming to your mind. For example, blessed as some kind of material blessing, health, position, titles, and all the different things, and we'll consider that maybe blessed. Could be, partially. What is your thought? What are you going through your mind? What is going through your mind when you think about the word blessed? Is it a state of being? Is it something that you are going through? Is it merely a feeling, something that you and I feel good about? If you really think about the text itself, if you even go think about the translation of the word blessed, we see that the blessed, the word blessed, was translated in some cases, happy. So for you, as you are reading a scripture, and if you are reading happy is the man, or happy is he or she, you will have a certain type of understanding that the blessed, or the word, the meaning of it is simply your emotion state. There is something going on as far as the word, the meaning of the word. And today, my goal is to examine the scripture together in order to get a clear understanding of what blessed actually means. Because we are in the United States, you know, so we are uh, 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 faced with a lot of different teachings. Um, where you will hear something in the nature of God wants to bless you, or you will say in something of the nature of I am blessed. Uh, and a lot of time, if you watch TVN long enough, that it, it has to do with the material blessing for sure. But my challenge this morning for us as a church, as a body of Christ, that we examine this word in order that we may have a clear understanding. Because for me and for us, accuracy, the truth matters. Partial truth will not suffice. We have to have the entire truth of the meaning of that word in order that we may proceed to understand the meaning and the teaching of our Lord Jesus. And so my Hypothesis or thesis for today will be something like this. It is critical to know the meaning of the word blessed, to grasp the true meaning of the Sermon on the Mount. Opposite is also true, that if we misinterpret or misunderstand the meaning of this word, we'll miss the true meaning 
of the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody good? Let's proceed. Matthew chapter 4. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Let me show you the map, because I love to enjoy my laser pointer so much, I brought it back. So if you look at this, is the whole entire upper region. This is a lower Galilee. Nazareth is located right in this point. And this right here is the Sea of Galilee. And this is upper Galilee, stretching all the way to Mount Hermon, which is the highest mountain in the Middle East. And the Capernaum is located right here, and the Sea of Galilee is right here. And so for you, for not understanding the map, if you have not actually heard or seen the map for the first time, if you're seeing it for the first time, you start to recognize that Sea of Galilee is not really a sea. It's actually a lake, right? 14 miles by 7 miles, okay? 14 miles this way, high, 7 miles this way. And this is a very accurate uh, point that we know. In the picture, next slide, there is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. And this right here is a Mount Arbel. And then this is the Sea of Galilee, where it's only the half of the Sea of Galilee. There's entire another half right here, but obviously, photos cannot do the justice. And so if you actually want to see the Sea of Galilee yourself, you can join us from June 13th through 22nd. Shameless plug this morning. We're going to Israel. You can actually join us, okay? And if you want more information, you can talk to me or you can talk to Cassie. We'll give you more information. We'd love to have you. We still have some spaces available if you'd like to join us this summer, okay? The reason why I'm mentioning all these places is because these are not made up places. These are actual cities and actual places that is mentioned in the scripture. And now we recognize that this is the actual ministry of Jesus. Now, you may be wondering though, why did he leave Nazareth and decide to go to Capernaum? And I believe that the scripture that we just read this morning about the prophecy in Isaiah, which I will talk about a little bit, that there is a specific thing or actions that Jesus is taking in order to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet in the Old Testament. And so we see that evident here. Now, Capernaum is really interesting. We pronounce this city. We butcher a lot of the Hebrew words, and this is one of them. It's not Capernaum. It's Kafar Nahum. Kafar Nahum means village of comforter. Village of comforter. The reason why there Jesus decided to make his home, the plan, the this station where he would do majority of his work, is all part of God's plan. If you think about it, in Isaiah chapter 40, it begins like what? Comfort, oh, comfort my people, says your God. And so one of the mission of Jesus, now we know that last week celebrated Easter, so you know one of the reasons that he came was to become the Lamb of God, to sacrifice, die for us on our sins, Resurrected on the third day, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, mission number two. Another mission Jesus actually had coming down from heaven is to be the comforter. And how did he exercise, or how do we take his title and became the comforter of God's people? Is that he did by teaching, preaching, healing. Casting out the devil, demons, and even the raising of the dead. These are the action of the comforter, the sign of the Messiah that is written about in the Old Testament. 
So Jesus did not just do things out of his own accord. There is a specific things, actions that he has taken to make sure that the people that actually see him and encounter him will understand that he is the Messiah that is promised in the scripture. Verse 14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And that is the tribal occurrence, okay? So there's a tribe that was allocated when they actually came to the land of Israel, the original 12 tribe they came in. And Zebulun and Naphtali is one of the tribes, okay? And that's pretty much the Galilee region that we're looking at, okay? So the map we looked at earlier about the Sea of Galilee is actually the, where the location, what this prophecy is coming to fact. The by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those set in region and shadow of that light has dawned. In verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this kingdom of heaven, the issue of the kingdom of heaven is a lot to talk about. And I hope, I'm not going to be able to get there too much. I might be able to just give you a little bit. I hope our uh, starter uh, contributors will be able to touch a little bit farther than I can. But obviously, we know that the Matthew, the apostles, and the disciples, when they are writing these gospels, they have understood that Jesus is a fulfillment of the old prophecy. The prophecy that has been given to the prophets and now is being fulfilled. And it was fulfilled through Christ. And not only that, we see Jesus himself acting, teaching, and doing things that also signify that he is the Messiah that was promised. N.T. Wright is a scholar and theologian said it this way. The gospel tell the story in such a way as to hold together the ancient promises and the urgent current context, with Jesus in the middle of it all. There's no good reason to doubt that this was how Jesus himself saw his own work. But what did he mean? The prophet Isaiah, in line with the several Psalms and other biblical passages, God spoke, had spoken of God's coming kingdom as time when one, God's promises and purposes would be fulfilled. Two, Israel would be rescued from pagan oppression. Three, evil, particularly the evil of oppressive empires, would be judged. And D, God would usher in a new region of justice and peace. The word, world was to be turned the right way up at last. To speak of God's kingdom arriving in the present was to summon up entire narrative and to declare that it was reaching its climax. And so when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there is a signaling, signaling of a Christ fulfilling the mandate that has been spoken of in the scripture. Everybody still good? Verse 23, we'll continue. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching, again I mentioned earlier, how did Comforter Acts, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with the various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, he healed them. Great multitude followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. So you, you can actually put a map that I want to show you is that this entire region, remember, uh, again, uh, you saw earlier where the Galilee is located, right? This is Decapolis. Decapolis is not really Decapolis. 
the, the way you actually pronounce the capital is Decapolis. Decapolis. Decapolis means 10 cities. Okay, there were literally 10 cities in this region, right? There were polis. There was a polis means city. There is certain criteria that you actually had to have to be considered a city or polis according to the Roman system. And so, all these 10 cities were located in this direction. There was only one here in this side of the, this bank of the Jordan. This is the Jordan River, and this is the Dead Sea, and this is where one of the Decapolis is. You can actually go there today. It's a Roman ruins, right? Made, of the, uh, uh, made with the uh, volcanic rocks. Beautiful place. Uh, you don't have to go to Rome to see the Roman city. Uh, you can actually go to Israel and see the Roman city for yourself. But no plug there. Just telling you exactly how the city actually is. But entire region, Jerusalem is located right here. The Judea is here. Samaria. And this whole entire region is coming to this tiny city called Capernaum or Capernaum because people were sick and ill and they were desperate. At that time, in time of Christ, you have to understand that they did not have the medical system like you and I have today. There are certain diseases or sicknesses that we can just pop a pill and we should be good to go. But back then, it can be pretty dramatic where you would not be able to even heal. And so it is common to know that if there is any way for you to be healed, people are going to be flogging. And so that's what you have. A lot of people that are coming from all over the region to see Jesus, but to do what? To be healed. To cast out demons. And all these elements that Jesus is doing to the masses that are drawing to him. And so, yes, his fame went throughout all the area, And now, great multitude. When we say great multitude, there's a multitude and there's a great multitude. Great multitude is thousands. Or some will consider tens of thousands. And if you are healing people, casting out demons, yeah, you will be there too. But this is what is happening. And I just want to make sure to give you a proper context before we actually move on to the Sermon on the Mount, okay? That was just introduction. (laughs) And so Matthew 5, and seeing the multitude, there's that multitude again, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, Here is the picture of what Sermon on the Mount, historically or traditionally, to this region to be the Sermon on the Mount actually taking place. This is where the church is actually located. You can actually visit there today. It's a Catholic church, uh, but good place to visit. Uh, But, you know, if you come with us, we don't go there. We go here. The reason being is that we believe that this area, this specific area, is the place where Jesus taught the multitude. There are some, though, some of those who actually point to different places, like a really steep mountain. But my mentor told me the best, Jesus was not a military commander. He was a shepherd. If you have a sick, if you have a family, it's not a military mission here. He's not going to make you climb a heavy mountain just so that people can see him. He's going to find a location where it's easy for you to come. And that's what he did. He found an easy location where people can just come straight from the boats to arrive at this location where Jesus will be sitting somewhere up here teaching the people. Isn't that great? So this is boat. Uh, Obviously, this is... Uh, you know, I'm, when I'm taking this picture, you know, I'm, not, I'm also in a boat. I'm not walking on the water. Um, as some would actually test, if you have a high faith, if you're charismatic or Pentecostal, you do want to try it out, but usually I stop them. You know, it's, don't fool yourself. Um, has not succeeded ever since. P 
Peter starts to sink anyway. But anyway, that's just a side story. But this is the boat ride that you can actually go on to. You can actually go to the whole Sea of Galilee. And we get to point a lot of the cities where Jesus actually ministered, the historical death part, okay? So now, here we go. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, many times earlier, I even mentioned to you about we have this presupposition of this word. And we got the meaning of this word by facing, hearing different things from other Christians, other Christian pastors, or different things where we determine that blessed has to do with our well-being. Our well-being, whether it will be health, wealth, our condition, and as I mentioned earlier, maybe your happiness, your emotion. Could it be that there will be something more to the state of being just happy or having material possessions considered blessed? If you really want to examine this word, you actually have to go to the Old Testament. The word that I want to introduce you to in the Hebrew word is asherah. Say, repeat after me. Asherah which means blessed is in the Old Testament. The word actually derived from the word, every Hebrew word has a root word. Remember, it's a picture. Hebrew words are pictures. So the picture, the, the, the root word of asherah is ashar. Ashar in Hebrew, the meaning is a to be straight or straight forward. So if you imagine when the biblical writer or the thinker, the Hebrew mindset, actually tried to think about what blessed is, you will consider a man or woman walking in a completely straight path. Not distracted to the right or left, the man and woman that are straight, moving forward to the target like Brian mentioned earlier. But what is their target? What is really true meaning of a bless? Is it just walking on a straight line? Of course not. There's much more to it. To discover the meaning of it, we have to go to Psalms. In Psalms, this word asherah is mentioned 23 times. Now, there are other words such as brachi, which is bless the Lord. Look, if you say brachi, nafshi, yaladonai, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. That word, bless, is brahi, but it's not the term of blessed are or blessed is. It's a different word. And Hebrew words, it's, it's very clear it's a different word. And specifically, Asherah, we believe is Asherah that Jesus is referring to. And so let's go to Psalm and read some of these portions of Scripture. 23 times it's mentioned. So if we read a couple, at least we'll get a glimpse of what meaning it actually carries. Psalm 1-1, which is one of the beloved psalms, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. I intentionally made it small, so you have to write a note. Um, Psalm 2.12, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Psalm 32, 1 and 2, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Side note, this specific Psalm 32, 1 and 2 is a specific relation to the Nathaniel story in John, if you didn't know. Just side note, go check for yourself. Amazing. Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Psalm 34, which Kayla quote this morning, verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Psalm 84, 4, blessed are all those who dwell in your house that will still be praising you, and on and on and on. But there is a theme there. I don't know if you caught it or not. 
It does not have to do with your material blessing. Sorry. Thomas did not give us that example. But what he did give us is this relational aspect of a blessed one having this relationship with God. And because of this relationship with God, and this person is considered blessed. If we truly want to understand what this blessed means, then we have to see that it has nothing to do with your possession. It has nothing to do with what type of social economic status you have or how much education you have. Ultimately, it has to do with your current relationship with God. And that's the example we see in the scripture. I didn't say it. Scripture said it. So here it is. So now, now knowing that what blessed actually means. Let's go on to what is poor in spirit. No, before we do that, one thing that I do want to mention is that asherah, or the blessed is, or blessed are, are covenantal terms. It's a covenant terms. What I mean by covenant terms is that it's God is making covenant with his people. And because God made covenant with his people, his people are considered blessed. It's absolutely covenant that God is making with his people, even in the New Testament. Why did Jesus come in the first place? Obviously, yes, he died for our sins, but is that all? Or is there much more? And we see that even in the Gospel of John, he says he came, gave the right for you and me, still talking about the, what Jesus has done, he came to give us a right to become the children of God. And that is the covenantal terms that Jesus is making. That through Christ, that we can have a covenant relationship with the Father. Which was what was lost in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. After the fall of man. You see, scripture is all connected. It's not separate. It's not compartmentalized. But somehow, some way. It is all interconnected. So, let's go to poor in spirit. The word poor in Hebrew means, sound as like this, is anavim. Anavim is mentioned or reflected or mentioned in Isaiah chapter 61. And in chapter 61, verse 1, you probably heard this before, so I will proclaim it to you again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Have you heard this before? Yes. It's in Luke, actually, when Jesus was proclaiming his ministry. In Nazareth, he's reading from the Isaiah scrolls. At that time, you have to, there's a, there's a, there's a roll that you actually have to roll to the, get to the specific place. They did not have a chapter number, by the way. So you have to memorize the entire thing to know where those texts are. Think about scripture memorization for us. Try to remember the whole entire book. But, you know, Jesus was son of God. He knows the entire book, of course. So he's scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And people are just waiting to hear what he's going to say. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to who? Poor or anavim in scripture. Poor in spirit, or poor in this sense. If you think about Isaiah 61 as a prophetic verse, where Jesus said, even at, at the end of proclaiming who he is in Luke, today, he said, at the end of that reading of that verse, he said, today, the scripture has been fulfilled. And he dropped the mic. And he sits down. Amazing. What do you mean this scripture is fulfilled? Who are you? The people start to complain and grumble and whatnot. But Jesus knew exactly what he was or he came to do. 
And we see that very clearly. And so we see that the one of the sign of the Messiah or the signaling what Messiah will do is that the gospel will be preached to the poor. And even then, if you think about when actually John the Baptist, when he was in prison, sends his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one or should we wait for another? And what was the response of Jesus? Blind seas, sick are healed, dead are raised. This is the climactic, right? You see, there's like a, it starts with a slow, it starts with a healing. I mean, healing. <laughs> Just healing is great, but like, he goes and dead are raised. Like he goes to the place where he goes to healing all the way to the dead are raised. But is that the climactic? No. The last thing he says to the disciples of John, to tell the John the Baptist that the poor has the gospel preached to them. So what is this great miracle that's bigger than raising a dead? Prophecy being fulfilled that the commoners, the people that's been rejected by the religious, people that were not considered even the citizen, right citizen at that, people such as fishermen, people such as tax collectors, prostitutes, all these people are hearing the gospel for the first time. And who was Jesus preaching to? These groups of people. And what's their response? They turn, repent, and follow him. Because for the first time, somebody was willing, was willing to share the good news, the message of God's intent to restore his people to himself. The poor have gospel preached to them. Now, you may be wondering, though, your previous, now, I know we're all holy and righteous. You guys are very wise intellectuals. You probably already thought that, gee, I already knew the blessed means that. I, I was sure that blessed doesn't have nothing to do with the blessings, prosperity, or anything of that nature. But if you actually had that definition in the beginning, blessed are poor in spirit is not. It's contradictory. It simply would not work, wouldn't it? How can you be blessed and poor at the same time? How can you be blessed and be persecuted? I thought you were blessing. Isn't that what the prosperity gospel teaches us today? That if you are not blessed or if you have a monetary blessing, there's something wrong with you. Contradictory to the actual text that we find. What we see, the true meaning is blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, I said poor but now, Jesus goes one step further. He says, poor in spirit. Leon Morris, uh, one of the uh, um, theologians that I regularly follow, he said it this way. The poor in spirit, in the sense of this beatitude, are those who recognize that they are completely and utterly destitute in the realm of the spirit. They recognize their lack of spiritual resources and therefore their complete dependence on God, poor in spirit, is afflicted in spiritual life. They are bankrupted in spiritual life. One who is desperate to know God. Sounds like every one of us at one point. That we're all in some way poor in spirit. But does it end there? No. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is promised. So now, let's put it all together, shall we? Blessed are, which we say the blessed are those one who actually have a relationship with God, poor in spirit. You are destitute. You have nothing. You have no way to know God. 
but it is they who will inherit the kingdom. And so, yes, you are poor in spirit. When you are poor in spirit, you are considered blessed. When you are desperate to know God, that's when you are considered blessed. When you are humble, that's when you are blessed. When you are persecuted, that's when you are called blessed. Why? Because it has to do the way of God, has to do with the character of God, and it has to do with everything about God that we see in the scripture. And here's the kicker. What if, what if, just throwing it out there, if God's intent from the beginning was to restore us to the beginning? You know, before the fall, the pre sinful state, what if God's intent to bring us back to him, not only that, to send his own son into the world that you and I can finally go back and return to the garden where God is. To me, that's the good news. That is what we call good news, that God in his goodness and his mercy have made the way for you and I to return to the garden. And it's not you. Don't get it twisted. It's nothing that you can possibly do to earn your way back to the garden. No, no, no. The only way that is possible is to understand that you are sinful and you are in desperate need of a savior. And that when that understanding comes to your heart and you repent of your sin and turn, which basically means turn and go different direction, to do what? To follow him. Isn't that what we see in the scripture? All these people, they hear the Jesus, good news, they turn and follow him. Gospel. And that blessed state that God wants to have in our lives. So what does it mean to be blessed? I hope, I hope that you will approach this word in a new way. That next time when you read the Sermon on the Mount, for next six weeks even, when we're studying the Sermon on the Mount... Remember, the blessed is not so much about material things or your feelings, but it's about relationship with God. Blessed means a person, actual person, who have been given a covenant relationship God, with God through Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Blessed means a person who have been given a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I am reminded that sometimes we need to change our ways, change the way we think. And sometimes God inspire and move in our lives in a such a way that he brings enlightenment to our soul to better understand who he is and what he does. And the scripture is full of stories of men and women who gave their entire life to be with God, to be like God. God. And there is a sign, there is a trait that they carry. Not only they fear God, but they put their entire trust in Him for who God is. 
And the history teaches us that, you know, many of the saints who proclaimed the Lord Jesus did not see the good end. They have met swords. They have met the cross themselves. But I wonder what they're going through, what their minds are going through when they're in that place. And I am reminded of the word of Paul when he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I truly believe these saints understood the true meaning of what blessed means. They understood there are treasures far greater that this world has to offer. And they have given their own life because they foreseen the glory and the majesty and the good of God that they will encounter, not if, not if this life, but the life to come. And then we say, as a believers, can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? If you're believers here today, remember the treasure that you hold. Remember the covenant relationship which is much more precious than anything this world has to offer. And if you are one that is still seeking, if you do not believe that Jesus is the Lord, God has made a way. God has made a way for you to have a blessed life. All you have to do is repent of your ways and choose this day whom you will serve. Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you are those who want to know more about Jesus, you know, there you can come and talk to us, one of us, our staff, our elders, our deacons, we're all here for you. But you can also fill out one of those cards, the blue card that is in front of you. If you know more about Jesus, if you want to talk to, we would love to talk with you, discuss more about God. And God wants to reveal himself to you in a mighty way. Okay? Let us pray. Father, we worship you. We thank you today for who you are and what you have done. And Lord, you have given us life, blessed life that's far greater than anything and everything this world has to offer. The world says, come and worship me. I will give you the world. But you say, come to me. I'll give you life. I pray that Lord, you give our brothers and sisters the life, the blessed life, and I pray that, Lord, that they will remember and they will even today understand the covenant relationship with you. And I pray this in the name of our loving Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.